An interesting aspect of the Chinese EV sector, Michael, is the when we talked about this in one of the previous interviews, is its integration with the electronic supply chains. Could you maybe give us an overview of what those supply chains look like? Hmm. Uh, maybe an anecdote serves as well. I asked uh, recently a researcher in the industry, could you send me the list of suppliers that Tesla works with in China? And, he's, and he said, yeah, of course I can. So it came across in English and in Chinese. And I immediately scanned it looking for the usual suspects like a Bosch and Denso, a Lear, a Aptiv, uh, a, a Hyundai Mobis maybe. I couldn't find them. One after another, what I did see was Chinese name followed by Electronics Company Limited, Electric Company Limited, Electronic Machinery Limited. So it was transformative moment to see that actually most of the suppliers in China feeding into these car makers come from the electronics industry, not the auto industry. Does that mean, and I'm assuming that there are, uh, because China had um, kind of an, it had an internal combustion engine, gas and mm -hmm. diesel industry, that there would have been a supply chains for that part of the industry. You know, as you make a body, you can make wheels and tires and suspension and so on. And, mm -hmm. and that has been able, to, that part of the supply chain has been able to scale up as well? Absolutely. I'm glad you mentioned that, Markham, because it's not that well understood. Uh, let's take Lear, for example. Can you imagine how many plants does Lear have in China? You go, well, a couple of plants. No, they have 60 factories in China. They've scaled up over the last 30 years, supplying seats and what they call e-systems to all global automakers, not just Lear. Bosch is in there, Denso, BASF, Valeo. Um, the, the blue chip suppliers from every country have all entered and set up hundreds of manufacturing plants in China. So a Xiaomi gets started, they go, oh, I want the best seats in the world. How about suspension over here, chassis work, wheels? It's all there in their backyard. They didn't have to invent it. Someone else brought it in, it's in place. And because we've seen global automakers share take a dive in China, those suppliers now go, well, we need to do something with our factories. We'll, we'll, we'll supply them to the Chinese. So in a way, wow. I mean, the Japanese had to build up their own suppliers. The Koreans did. The Chinese go, well, it's already here, right here in China. We don't have to do anything. So that's a huge advantage that they enjoy. How, uh, how low cost can these supply chains go? Like we've seen... Mm -hmm. If I remember correctly, uh, Michael, the the uh, uh, BYD's Dolphin is like nine or ten thousand dollars in the Chinese market. Yes. Uh, are we going to see five thousand dollar EVs? Are we going to see where where does this stop? BYD with the Dolphin recently reduced its price to just eight thousand dollars, and it's a terrific little car. I, I recently test drove one in Mexico City. After shipping and tariffs in Mexico and dealer margins and everything else, it gets up to 20000 but that's still a great deal for most of North American consumers. So uh, half of BYD's global sales are vehicles priced under $25,000. That's the norm. They're used to that in China, and they come across to North America. Our average price of a new car here, $50,000. So it's like it's inevitable that we're going to see the Chinese building those low cost vehicles and one way or another finding a way into our market here. Well, let's not talk about our market now. I mean, uh -huh. th this seems to be ideally custom made for the global South where you've got yes. emerging economies where the, you don't, the incomes there are not as high as they are in North America or Europe. So mm -hmm. are we going to be seeing, you know, like can China sell a, a $10,000 dolphin in Brazil or, or someplace like that? The, the prices will be closer to fifteen twenty, but still quite affordable. Much depends on how efficiently, you know, the Chinese are beginning to set up plants in other countries, in Thailand, in Indonesia, in Brazil, in Hungary. So let's see where, where costs go, because that's complex. You know, you're moving manufacturing overseas. You have to communicate, bring people and all the rest. But the major takeaway for me, a personal one was, for two decades, Markham, I lived and worked in Southeast Asia, Thailand, Indonesia. Every year, like clockwork, the Japanese had 90 to 95% market share. 
No one could touch them, not the Koreans, not the Germans, not the Americans, despite billions in investment. It was a Japanese fortress. Well, that fortress is just crumbling right now. Uh, I just met executives from a, one major Japanese car company. They said, we, we can't believe it. The Chinese are pouring in here with product that is 15 to 20% lower cost than we can match. And we have no answers for them. And the Chinese are in Thailand are up to 20% market share overnight. So to your point, the Chinese are targeting the global south and being quite successful. Well, that leads me to another question is, uh, will they use the supply chains that are centered in China and export mm -hmm. things like batteries and, and components, or will they set up entirely separate supply chains in the Thailand's Vietnam and mm. Brazil and so on, uh, or will it be a hybrid of the two? It looks like phase one is final assembly. Let's be honest. So what an automaker, what they like to do is that, yeah, we'll set up a plant in your country will do some investment, but the core components, including the battery, uh, the motors will still come from China until such time when the scale is big enough, the volume is big enough to justify greater investments in those local plants. But first phase is sort of get around the terrace with a local assembly plant. That's just like the global automakers did worldwide for decades. China is going to follow that same playbook. Does that mean that uh, there's an expectation on behalf of the governments that are very often welcoming the Chinese companies and providing support and infrastructure and so on, that once that scale is there, the expectation is the companies will begin to build local supply chains? A hundred percent. Absolutely. And if I could offer any advice to those governments, it would be they have to really be tenacious about their expectations and their demands on the Chinese. If they let them... You know, whenever you guys are ready, come on and know that's not going to work. Um, you, I was interested to see earlier this week, the European Commission said, you know, in order to give Chinese automakers access to this market, when they come in manufacture, they will absolutely have to transfer technology and we're going to monitor that closely. So look for more of that uh, to make sure that value actually gets transferred. Well, Michael, uh, thank you very much for this. Really appreciate it. All right. Absolutely.